All right, um, John Morgan with the Pennsylvania Progressive. I'm here this morning in media with Joe Sestak. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, John. Beautiful. It's a gorgeous day here. It's a beautiful park here at Rose Tree Park, uh, just outside media. It's, it's just great. I remember my very first campaign right over there in the amphitheater, the United States Naval Academy, okay. my, where I went to yeah. college. Uh, they came and uh, did a concert there. Okay. It has good memories right here, and I live right down the street. Yeah, of course, so much of your life is centered around the military. Uh, even your victory party uh, primary night was at Valley Forge Military Academy, as I recall. It was. Um, we almost had it at an abandoned garage because <laughs> we were out of money. We're out of Schlitz, basically, <laughs> at the end of that primary. And then we eked a little bit up just to be able to get okay. it over there. Uh, but they very you know, fairly inexpensive. I really remember that night. I was there in the press area and uh, I remember your aides, all your, your staff people just jumping up and down in a big circle, all these young guys, you know, when the word came in that you won. It was, it was great. Uh, I, I, I went back and I remember talking to the Chief of Naval Operations and I told him, you know, if I'd done in the last year and a half after the final mm. general election, first, particularly when I ran against my own party's established, yes. when I felt I was there for the people, I would have been a better naval officer. Mm. I, I really worked with the youth. Mm. There was no pros from Dover, so to speak, in our right. campaign. We were just people. <laughs> you cared. were the insurgents. And, uh, and we got everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, we ended up going, because we couldn't go to certain, you know, Philadelphia was kind of closed down to us yeah. as far as Democratic establishment, so was Allegheny County. and. And so those were the majority of, at least in a primary, Democratic, Democratic voters. Saw. Yeah. So we started going to churches, mosques, synagogues, Sikh, uh, Sikh temples. We went everywhere. And so the feeling was that, yes, you know, we'd been out with people and government of and for yeah. by the people. And it, it felt great. Well, I remembered your car because I went out to Cambry County that weekend before the election and kind of followed you to a couple yes. campaign stops in Cambry County and on to Pittsburgh and stuff like that. And I was following you. <laughs> I forget what the road was, but for <laughs> we were just going. There was three of yeah. us usually in the car. Yeah, uh, and you were there with the phone I glued to your. I had the right ear. front seat. Yep. I'm using the cone, getting business done. Uh, ben Takamoto was your chip right? was usually driving in the back seat. We, uh, he, John Payne just sat there pounding away on a wireless computer. Yeah. But then we usually would leave a, like Pittsburgh at, six, at 10 p.m. at night, we'd come all the way to Philadelphia, about six hour drive. And each of us would take two hours, so we'd right. take, get in about four, catch a couple hours of sleep, out there again by seven. It was great. Well, you're kind of famous for getting on without much sleep. Uh, well, that's from your Navy days, isn't it? It's having to be on the bridge. A lot of it is. Um, from the bridge, and when I commanded my first ship in the early 90s, uh, we went into the Persian Gulf. And by naval regulation, when a ship is coming within five nautical miles of you, the captain's always awakened and told what the officer mm. of the deck is going to do. Well, in the Persian Gulf, <laughs> there are not only tons of, uh, of oilers and tankers going yeah. everywhere, but there's thousands, it appears, of what you call the cigarette boats, often right. doing smuggling between Iran and uh, okay. Oman or somewhere, going back and forth. So all the time you're being awakened, so you get used to it. Okay. You just kind of learn to function on... You do. I mean, it's also was the excitement of the campaign, okay. quite honestly. Yeah, the I, adrenaline? I, I think it's one of the most wonderful things that you can experience, the adrenaline. You're out there, and you're meeting what some might call the common people, but I know once I remember Ronald Reagan actually said, no, they are uncommon people. Everyone is different. And that was what kept you going. I'll never forget going down and, uh, and uh, running down along the streets, trying to get to the next event, and all of a sudden this trash truck uh, uh, starts honking at me. And I look over, and I didn't know what was going on. And, the gentleman reads out the track truck and goes, Hey, Joe Sestak, <laughs> we got your back. <laughs> How can you pay that back? Yeah. Yet they put you through a pretty challenging uh, Iron deal. Man. Yeah. And they should, because when they get in, you get into office, they want to know if you're going to have their back. Right. And so it's a real thrill to go through that. Um, well, know, that primary night was your highlight. Um, was that the most... Me what was the most memorable night of your life, of I, your career. I, I, that? Would, I would say there was two events that occurred during that campaign that will always stick in my mind. 
one was the gentleman I just spoke about. All right. Where, he, with a couple days to go, we were surging ahead, and three poles and you're tired had at us that ahead point by too. a point to three. Yeah. And we, we were tired, we're running to the next event. But the opposition, again, I was out of Schlitz, no money in the general election, <laughs> poured in about $3 million yeah. from Carl Rove and the boys, you yeah. know what I mean? And Because they only had money going for them. Right. But we had, despite a tsunami, come so close, and that man who yelled out to me, yeah. hey, Joe, we got your back. The other one was when I was deciding whether to get in against the establishment's right. desires, and I was in Potter County up on the northern oh, tier yeah. of Pennsylvania. I've been there. Been there. And you drive in and it's got a... Nothing but trees and mountains. It's exactly. It's got a beautiful <laughs> sign when you're in a pot of county. It says, welcome to God's country. country. Yeah. And you go down a little bit and it's just gorgeous. And only about two people came out <laughs> at my first meeting, maybe a couple more. Because I was oh, trying to decide that was maybe half the county. <laughs> one of them was a farmer as I was chatting with him. And uh, I was trying to... I said, how's the recession? And mind you, this is a few years ago. Yeah. And he said, and it's the only way a farmer could do it. And that dry smile uh, that he had, and just looked at me and says, not too bad. I was already hurt. <laughs> and you sit there, and here he was, he with his get persistence, much slower, huh? with ability just yeah. to keep on going, but knowing times have been tough for a while. Yeah. And yet he keeps on going. That said to me, get in. That man at the end said, so worth doing it. And so, yeah, those were two events that have always stuck in my mind. Yeah. Of course, that was the, the famous race against Arnold Inspector, who was the anointed Democratic candidate. Then along comes Joe Sestak to challenge him as, quote, the real Democrat, unquote. Well, I think it was something even beyond that. What I find as I left the Navy and entered politics is that our leaders in Washington, on the whole, and I would argue, John, to a degree in both parties, have lost the trust of Americans because they're not willing to be held accountable for what is the responsibility. Who wants to hold up their hand and say, yeah, I, I, I should have been better for Wall up. Street and, you know, make, not let them gamble with our savings, you know? Why is it always after the fact that no one wants to be held accountable? Like a captain on a ship, if I ran aground the Persian Gulf, even if I was asleep at 2 a.m., I was responsible for the safety of that ship. I would be relieved for cause immediately. And I think that's what they felt. It's why I didn't run for my congressional seat at the same time as I ran for the Senate seat. And I could have. I love this district. Yeah. If you can't be in the Navy, it's the next best thing you can do right. is serving people in office. But I felt I had to show that I was accountable for what I was about to step into. And I wasn't just trying to hold on to a job as a safe insurance right. in case I didn't get the other right. one. That to me is, was, the, is the, it was the difference of the campaign. What do you think of what they've done to your old district, the 7th Congressional District, now meanders through five counties. It comes up near me in Berks County. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a shame for the primary purpose of, if it is a government of the people, because they've made it so dispersed and it's it's actually ranked as the first or second least consolidated mm. district in America. It makes it harder for people to have access to you, for you to have access to them. That's the real crying shame. Now, I would also argue, however, John, that this district is as winnable as it was the first time I ran okay. in 2006 mm. against the then Republican right. incumbent. I was the second Democrat, as you know, Kurt since Weldon. the Civil War. Yeah. And heck, we started in that campaign about the same as we did against Arlen Inspector. About, I think that one was 35 points down against <laughs> the senator, who's like 40 points down. He was an and entrenched incumbent. Right. And we did it just by working away. Look, at the end of the day, people are real, have, just they have real common sense. They want to know, are you honest? Are you competent? They're not only for anybody brilliant. Thank goodness they're not. <laughs> they're competent. And are you do you know a little bit about me and what I'm going through? Me being the citizen. It isn't about the person being elected. It's whether you know what they're going through. And then are you able to define for them the real character that they feel innately of America? And that's this wonderful balance between rugged individualism, man, we love to everybody oh, yeah. to reach beyond their grasp, but always aligned with the common enterprise, the common wealth yes. of Pennsylvania. How do you get the road so we can have our entrepreneurs get their commerce to market quickly? 
how do you have the right public schools that are working effectively? And they're not all. That's why I'm going to a meeting right after this in downtown Philadelphia, three hours on education. But that everyone has an opportunity, not just to be all they can be, but then to contribute to the common wealth of Pennsylvania so we all benefit. What do you say to those people who don't feel they have an obligation to invest in their communities and, and, and pay their share of taxes? That's not America's character. It's, it's not Americans at our best. I saw in the military every day. We all came together and everyone wanted to be their best. Every SEAL wants to be the best SEAL. It's that scene till six knew that they couldn't succeed in their mission unless they came together and had one another's back. Right. I feel the same way about America. Why do you think men and women join up and say, I'm gonna join the military? Why do you think they went to, to Washington, D.C. when not John F. Kennedy asked, ask not what, what your country you can do for you, ask, ask what, what you can do for your country. country. Because but we've people lost have that pride sense. pride about working in yeah. government or pride about, now, do we need to be a lot more accountable? You bet we do. You and I know that, John. But it doesn't mean you don't become more effective and be more efficient. You want to do that. But at the same time, right here in Pennsylvania, the very first public school was, was founded in 1682, a century prior to our revolution. And the governor of the Commonwealth at that time said, everyone's going to attend. The rich will pay a reasonable fee. The poor will attend for, for, for free so that everyone could contribute to the Commonwealth. We are founded on that rugged individualism, but always aligned as being part of the greater effort. We are contributing and adding more rungs so others can climb even higher later on, and therefore our children prosper better. But we seem to be, there seems to be movement to take us backwards, for, away from public education, uh, to, to really eradicate our system of public education. Um, you know, whether it's the, the vouchers, uh, charter schools, things like that. Um, you said, you know, you're going to this meeting in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is, has some very, very serious problems. They say their schools may not even open come September. Um, how do you see the uh, issues in public education? I see, let's just take the Philadelphia area and why I'm involved in it and go to meetings quite frequently and go to a school somewhere Pennsylvania usually every week is we have let our children down. Only about 27% of African American males ever graduate in Philadelphia from school. And for whites, it's about 33%, nearly identical. So to some degree, John, I would argue that the system has let them down. I, I really do believe it. And it isn't just trying to throw more money at it, it's saying, wait a moment, do we have the leaders there that are going to be held accountable with benchmarks for the performance of those schools mm -hmm. down there? And I think that that has not occurred as much as it could be. Now, on the other hand, when you have a child that is growing up in a family that is living in poverty and single mom is out there working all the time and that youth isn't able to go down the streets until they get into that school and say, I feel safe again. A lot of then times they don't even feel safe in the saying, school. Right. Well, sometimes they don't. That's absolutely. So then all of a sudden you say, wait a moment. It isn't about cutting. It is about making do so much more with what we have down there. So when you have too many administrators and not enough of the quality teachers, you have an issue. But to then, but to begin to walk away and say, that's a problem, I don't want to deal with it. That does us, all America, an injustice. So the issue here is, how do you say, look, we're gonna hold you accountable as an individual, but we also know that we have to ensure that our public resources being well spent are spent to ensure that youth are being able to, to, to graduate and, and, and continue on. Look, this is the same problem in other cities. Chicago, for example, only has about 9% of its youth ever go to college. And so you have an issue here that if we're gonna compete in the future, Let's get those two in great alignment. Right. Well, you have a situation, too, where school districts like Lower Marion, frankly, spend double the amount per student than Philadelphia School District. There's such an imbalance in resources available. And that translates, too, as you said, to getting quality, attracting quality teachers. How do you 
recruit quality teachers to teach in something like Philadelphia School District when they can be out here in beautiful Delaware County. It's absolutely without right. Without the issues and the problems. With, without any question. Look, we brains are not distributed according to where property taxes are. <laughs> you know, I saw the youth from downtown Philadelphia and Upper Marion come into the military. They're all equal. You give them a fair opportunity and they can be all they can be and so America prospers. So the issue is, are we making sure that our resources are being properly secured okay. for those who are in disadvantaged areas? And then, number two, this issue about teachers. Let me tell you, my daughter's in public school. And my, my thing is, what a difference it makes according to the teacher that they do have. So, are we able to incentivize the teachers to go into what are, at times, as you mentioned, an unsafe environment and to be willing to do it? And at times, John, that's why I have been supportive since 2006 about saying there should be the additional pay incentives to attract those quality teachers into those areas that probably don't have the feeling of comfort you can't have right yeah. here. Because go downtown to the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard, now called Acker Shipyard. That's where my father worked. Today they're importing 180 welders from outside of Pennsylvania, or they were when I was a congressman a right. year ago, because they couldn't get the youth with the skills today to be a welder. Because a welder doesn't flip the helmet like the ark and lay the bead like I had and when you have to know what you're doing. in the 70s. They have to sit at a computer and design the bead in order to lay it down. Mm -hmm. Just down the street here is Delaware County Community College. Right. I visited a number of times, and they taught some youth how to be welders there. But as he told me, the president, we can't get the youth with the math and science, yeah. uh, computer science skill. So we're hurting ourselves to import welders from outside Pennsylvania. We don't want to be importing them from outside America. Right. We want our youth to have those jobs. And that's what the key is about education. And it is something to where we do need to use our collective resources to make it beneficial for everyone after we get everyone as a trained warrior in the workforce. Talked about your high point of that campaign. Let's talk about the low point. Um, last time I saw you before a couple weeks ago was where I just you were going on stage to concede to Pat Toomey. Was that the low point of your life? Definitely no. No. <laughs> I've been in the military. Everything after having this wonderful experience of having command of my first ship yeah. in the um, mid '90s where I was given the highest honor this nation could give anyone to lead its youth into harm's way. And then to command an aircraft carrier battle group in a war. No. All that mattered was the next day at 6 a.m. being downtown Philadelphia. Thank you, the voters. And starting to shake hands and say thank you. Look, we came within just a couple yeah, points. It was close. When there was a tsunami blowing everybody else uh, overboard from the governor's race to five congressional members, I mean, from an average of about 11 points. Look, the, our race was one that had the largest funding gap of any governor's or senate race in America. They had 23,000 television ads, we could only afford 11,000. But yet, because of people, coming out and still believing at a time of real discontent, it shows it can be done and the message was right and that they did believe. And so that's why I spent that year afterwards going to every of the 67 counties to yeah, say that was thank amazing. You. you did that at your own expense. Yeah. And so we went around and I just we just drove, it drove. But then I went to the major cities of America where I had contributors. After I'd done those who put sweat equity right. into us, those who would put financial yeah. equity into it to try to say thanks. Couldn't reach everybody, but if we had your email and I was coming into a place, right. we did it. Look, at the end of the day, I did not want people to think I'd been there just for you to vote. I went back to over a hundred of those places of worship yeah. I mentioned earlier in this interview to say thanks. Um, I didn't quite do it as many, because I won now a little bit of time for my daughter. As I said, it was now Alex time. Yeah. And I had left her for a war when I was in the military, and she had just been born, and and I was out on a different type of campaign. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it was great to, to, it was great. No, absolutely not. Do you have any regrets about giving up your congressional seat to make that no, Senate race? No, absolutely the right thing to do. As I said in my concession speech that night, 
the good Lord came down to me and said, hey, Joe, you get to do it all over again, the Senate campaign, but it will have the same outcome. When do you do it again? I do it again in a heartbeat. What I learned is almost indescribable. I mean, I was there with people who were coming out at a time of understandable anger that they felt everyone had let them down, that the American way of life was being threatened, and that people arguing, not about them going back to work, but just the bickering between the two parties. And yet, so many came out, I'd do it all again. I saw, so to speak, where my sailors came from. I had always banded them together in a common mission on a ship. And now if we went to serve America, now I saw them in their own homes, taking care of their families. Right. Taking, their where else can you see that? Except that if you can't be in the Navy, it's the next best thing you can do. <laughs> well, Pennsylvania is a big state, and it's hard to really appreciate how big it is till you run statewide for office. And it's why when they initially asked me to run against Senator Specter as a Republican, I said, no. It's, it's, I, I ran as a payback tour after I left the military to America for a congressional seat. My daughter had saved by the wonderful health care plan right. when she was four years old in the military. And I needed to address that issue. And after we took care of it, I got in and I worked hard for the national security that begins at home, begin with health care. Education security we talked about. Yeah. Not just health security, but also economic security. Because I saw it in the military. We don't give health care to everybody in the military because we're liberal. We're anything but. <laughs> what we tend to be are pragmatists. Right. And a healthy workforce in the military, a warrior force, meant we could do our job. Well, that's how it is in the workforce and civilian labor, mm-hmm. I believe also. So uh, my take on it was that it was just a wonderful experience all that time. And to give it up, no, it was right because I wanted to demonstrate it's not about my job, it's about yours. So I was... I was yeah, I just had breakfast with my mom this morning. She lives down here where I grew up, okay. about a mile and a half. Okay. And I live right down the road. And she hit my brother, who was, you know, yeah, the head I my can, you know, kid, you know, was there. And so I sat there and with her, and uh, as we came out, a woman came into Springfield Diner. And she stopped. She said, Joe, I said, Joe Sestak, I'm glad to see you. She said, I just want to thank you for what your staff and office did for me. I had a problem with Wells Fargo, a bank, mm-hmm. and I couldn't get anything done, and your office helped me out. That happens invariably as I walk around here. So in a sense, you do get real good pay Well, you're very well-known, you're very recognizable. I imagine, is, is there a price to pay for that too? I mean, sometimes do you wish you had more privacy than well, you have? Or? <laughs> I think my daughter, without a question, the very first campaign, July 4th, and she'd go ahead and be passing out brochures, and right. people are sitting there at a picnic, and by the time I came up behind her, <laughs> I had their phone, and she was a great campaigner. But then, you know, it does take, it's a lot of demands on the time. Yeah. If you serve 700,000 constituents, yes. and you work for them rightly as a public servant, I tell people, military command, aircraft carrier, battle group of 30 ships, 15,000 sailors in a war, the demands of my time were less there than it was want to do your hey, job Congress, right, but... serving 700,000 people as their representatives. But on the other hand, when I came home and you know, left in the morning, it was the skip. I enjoyed it so much. And so it brought a lot of quality to the family relationship. But it was something. It's also though why I didn't want to run for senator. When they asked me as I was moving up and they called, I said, no, it was a payback tour. It's a big state. This is how I'm paying back, working for education, working for the health care for my constituents, working for economic uh, security. But then after just calls from several people down in Washington and thinking about for two months and talking to the family, getting my daughters as well as my wife's agreement, we decided to do it. And then the switch came with Senator right. Specter. Then they said, sit down. And said, <laughs> we don't want you anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why I went around the six, seven counties for yeah. the first time and yeah. said, and listened yeah, the to that farmer tour. in Potter County. Yeah. And right when he spoke and said, you know what? I was already hurting before the recession. I knew that the American dream was being broken to where you could do better, your children could do better than you. And I saw it right there. And that's when I decided, yeah, we'll get in. Well, being a congressman, running 
statewide campaign for U.S. Senate. Tremendous demands on your time. Uh, your father, your husband. Um, are you enjoying having time to devote to that now? Yes. Um, as I said at the end of my concession speech and picked my daughter up as I spoke, it's now Alex time. The greatest gift I've ever been given. She's something. And as I mentioned, I went away 11 months right after 9-11. Right. She had just been born. And so when she was 9 and 10, just turned 11, yeah, April 26, just did. Yeah. I got time a lot more with her. Hershey Park next week. Right. <laughs> her and her best friend's birthday. You know, we, we keep celebrating right. it again another couple weeks. Yeah, it, it's it's great. But I've also stayed very involved. In the yes, you have. Because, it, you know, go to college uh, or uh, secondary school or trade school every week to try to keep in touch with the youth of America. They are our national treasure. They're the ones who are going to be held, or should be held, and will be to be responsible for the character of America's forward. My generation has to set up that character a little bit better. As you well said, it's going to one side. It's just about each individual. No, it's not. It's not just about each individual in the market. It is about why people came here. They came because they wanted individual rights. They wanted to be treated as everybody else would be treated, as an equal human being. And second, they also understood that you could use your collective resources to set the foundation for the American dream. In short, we built the ladder for them to climb up as individuals with our collective resources from our infrastructure that we have for transportation, as we have for energy, for, education. for wireless, yeah. for education. Yeah. And I would argue, crawling our way to health care so that people can climb it on their own but we've built the foundation for them to have an opportunity to be all they can be. And so that to me is something I still want to not rule out getting back in again, but to be able out there, you know, talking about the issues and, and, and being involved like in this public education. Well, you just mentioned about getting back in. Uh, what are your future plans, if any? Well, Do you have any immediate plans? Well, to make sure that my daughter doesn't feel I'm home too much, as she said the other day, because, Daddy, you're really getting a little too much in my homework. But I don't know exactly what uh, or if I'm going to get back in. But did I like it and did I enjoy serving? Yeah. Yeah, it was my whole life, the military oh, the, and then Congress. The so rumors about you challenging Governor Corbett? Yeah, I, you know, I've heard those, and I just haven't made up my mind, nor will I for a while. Um, I needed to say thanks needed to then help others as I've been doing. Yes. Other candidates that I believe in. And I've I've endorsed yeah. yes, yes Democrats, I've endorsed independents, I've endorsed Republicans. Uh, that yeah, I you would do the right thing. Yeah, you've uh, endorsed some insurgents, uh, <laughs> even against incumbent Democrats. Nathan Kleinman and Matt Cartwright come to mind. Because I think that the, the look, the Sabbath's not bad people, but I think the times have changed. I think Washington still doesn't understand. The people aren't moved because somebody from Washington dictates someone something. They've said, you, we've watched you the past years, the decade, and things haven't improved as we wanted to. We've had to spend a couple years trying to fix the damage that, and get us going again. I think they're looking for a different type of leadership, one that is really willing to sit down, even with those that may disagree with the candidate and listen and then say, I understand. Let's see if we do a principal compromise. But if not, here's where I'll stand, but I'll always listen. And darn it, if we don't accomplish what I say this way, I'm willing to be held accountable. And that again is why yes, I didn't run yeah. for my congressional seat. I had to show right. that I was willing to say, this is what it to should risk be, it this all. is the goal. Right? There was no fallback position. No, and there shouldn't be. It's why I turned down every single offer for lobby. It's just, yeah. no, I went in it to serve. Now, I gotta get out of my daughter's homework and <laughs> do something <laughs> Find something else to do. Well, let, let me uh, throw this at you. Um, just say, f you know, for hypothetical things, you ran for governor. Um, when you ran against our own specter, you ran against party establishment. You've endorsed some candidates running against party establishment people. Um, say, hypothetically, you became governor. Governor is 
the head of 